Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back to this quick additional coding session or lab session. Um, yeah, I'll be coming back to a few topics that we didn't come to in the last lab. And it will mainly be about uh, Keras advanced concepts in detail about customizing layers and um, customizing models in Keras. So this is useful for, for multiple things um, doing this whole customization um, workflow. The one thing for this, for what this is useful for is yeah, understanding how the internal mechanisms of Keras work, because we will implement a few things that are also yeah, very, very basic in detail. And then we'll try to understand how they are um, working in depth. But it's also, of course, useful if you want to implement some advanced concepts later in your projects. So um, yeah, maybe this will help you. The first topic we'll address here are the custom layers. And Keras allows you to do it. And we'll program two custom layers here. Feel free to pause the video and code along or try to implement your own solution. Also, the um, yeah, blank notebook and also the soft notebook are both online. So as I noted down here, defining custom layers in Keras is useful for on one hand, combining multiple predefined layers into a single custom layer. So you can actually kind of inherit other layers that are predefined or previously implemented into one kind of black box layer. But you can also use Keras, la uh, Keras custom layers to define the layer weights explicitly. We'll come to that in a minute. And it's also useful for modifying gradients, but this is very rarely used, I would say. But keep in mind that sometimes it's interesting, uh, if you do fine tuning, for example, to stop gradients after a certain layer. And this is also done uh, using this entry point. OK, let's dive right in. Uh, we have to implement a custom dense layer here. And we are asked to do it with a subclass of the TF Keras layers layer base class. I linked the docs here. Feel free to check it out. And we'll jump right in. Give it a name and have it inherit from the Keras layer. OK, at first, um, let's have a look at what we expect from this layer. So a dense layer is basically um, a linear transformation where you multiply your input with a weight matrix and add a bias vector. That's the whole magic there is to it. You can also add activation functions later, but uh, I didn't include that here. We'll do that later. Um, yeah, but, but you have to keep in mind that this is how the internal mechanisms will work. So um, let's first write the init function here. So I hope that you all already know at least the basics about object-oriented programming in Python. This will be useful here. If not, uh, feel free to ask, uh, for example, in the Discord chat. So as you can see here, I defined a parameter, which is the unit number. And this is kind of the output um, yeah, vector size of our dense layer. Uh, we yeah, give it as a preset default 32, but we can change this when we call the custom dense layer. And uh, yeah, here we call the init function of the superclass, which is our TF Keras layers layer. This comes in handy because it yeah, handles all kinds of initialization for us. It registers the layer, gives, gives it a name, uh, so we can use it later in our uh, Keras model workflow. We come to that at the very end. Um, yeah, now we have to somehow store 
our unit number to access it later and we'll do this as a simple um, class variable and that's it so i already said that i want the custom dense layer to be a linear transformation with a weight matrix and addition of a bias vector so let's simply do that note that we are not really overriding the python build in internal call mechanism here but rather this is overriding um, the call function inside the chaos layers uh, base layer class so this will be automatically handled by chaos chaos will detect that we overwrote this um, yeah this function and it will use it and yeah, I'm simply writing down a matrix multiplication of the inputs with um, a weights matrix that we didn't define yet, but we'll come to that in a minute. And we add a bias vector. Okay, so we have to define them and we want to define them as weights, which is as trainable variables uh, in Keras. Now one could ask, yeah, why don't we just do it in the init? Um, I mean, why not? Uh, we want to yeah, do it once. We could even argue that we could uh, define them in the call, but both methods are kind of wrong, both ideas. So we can define it in the call because we will later see that we can actually call the same layer, the very same level, layer multiple times without problems. And this should be supported. So we will have to define the, um, the weights once for the layer definition. And in the call, we should not refine or define any um, trainable variables. That would be bad style kind of. And the other idea, why don't we just yeah, define self.w and self.b over here in the init function? That's also a bad idea because we do not know the input shape yet. So as you can see, nowhere this has uh, an argument, the input shape. But if you recall linear algebra and matrix multiplication, we will need that to determine the shape of uh, self.w. Um, so how would we do it? Yes, we just override another method that's predefined in this tf carers layers layer which is build and build actually has as an argument the input shape but you will later will later see that we never actually use it explicitly because this build is completely handled internally by carers and we will never actually define the input shape directly rather carers will infer it from um, the representation that we pass into the custom dense layer doing our call. So yeah, pretty nice that we have this here and we can then use the input shape to simply um, define our W. So we use a TF variable, which we also set to trainable. That's a good idea here. And um, we also specify uh, the initial value. Check it here. Yeah. And we'll do that in a minute. We'll, we'll um, write a quick function that does this, but I want you to keep in mind that we have to define the shape and the d-type. So we choose float 32 here. Um, yeah, it's a float array and we or tensor variable. And we also define the shape. And if you recall linear algebra, then for this matrix multiplication, we have two dimensions. One dimension is our input dimension. So we get that from input shape. 
And the other one is our unit dimension, the output dimension, if you want. There's still one problem here. So the input shape is actually two dimensional because um, at the first point, we always have the batch, batch size. But uh, at, at the first dimension in input shape. But we don't need this here because if you recall the matrix multiplication, then our weights um, matrix doesn't need the batch size anywhere. So we simply just take the last dimension of our input shape and put it in here. And this will be enough. I quickly also define W init because we want to initialize this random variable. Uh, it would be a bad idea, I guess, to initialize this as zero because um, yeah, you would then get into troubles when you try to perform gradient descent because everything would be um, multiplied with zeros initially. But we rather use um, a random normal initializer, normally distribution, distributed. And this will allow us to at least start with a nice gradient descent. And we'll do pretty much the same with our bias vector, but this time we'll use a zeros initializer. And let's define the bias again as a trainable variable. And also with an initial value. And yeah, try to pause the video here and think a bit up about uh, the shape that we would get here. So the D type is float 32 again. And the shape is, you guessed it, self.units. And that's it. So this comma is just required to make this a tuple with one element. And um, yeah, this is what we add up in the in the end. We don't have any input shape related um, shape components here, uh, like we had with W. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Uh, we successfully defined our custom dense layer. I just want you to think a moment about um, why this over here works. So if you remember that inputs is not a real vector, but it's rather a matrix again with the shape, batch size, and then input vector length. So this matrix multiplication here is still well-defined, works well. And uh, what we get is not a vector, but rather a matrix again, with in the first dimension, the batch size as a shape, and then um, the output uh, unit shape. But as you see here, we added up with a vector that's yeah, one dimensional, we defined it here, but it still works. So, there's a bit clarification needed there. Why does it work? Well, um, first of all, shapes are broadcasted automatically when you use, uh, for example, this addition in TensorFlow. So it's detected, ah, okay, this is two-dimensional shape and this is a one-dimensional shape, but it kind of matches up. You have this self-unit shape here and um, self-unit shape here in one dimension. So this gets broadcasted. So like, of, yeah, imagine stacked multiple times. Um, and this multiple is exactly the batch size and then uh, added. And the intuition behind that is that we need to treat each and every, um, yeah, entry in our batch, each and every, um, record or sample the same way. So we always add the same vector. And this also leads to um, yeah, this vector being adjusted with um, every batch component or every sample in the end when we do the gradient descent. 
So this is why it works and why it is okay to do it. Let me quickly check whether I did any syntax mistake. No, I didn't. Okay, so now we defined our very own layer. The takeaway here is um, be very clear about what your arguments are, what the arguments or, or the parameters are you want to infer once you have the input shape actually. Be clear about um, what this TF variable does and that it would be not okay to define this self W and self B as constants, for example. You want them to be trainable here. And um, yeah, use call in the end to override what the layer does when it's called. In the very end of the session, we'll see how this is called actually. Okay, let's, let's go on with our custom dropout layer here. We do it in a very similar fashion. Again, override TF Keras layers layer. Or not, not override, but inherit and then override functions. And this time, as an argument, we take the dropout weight. So if you recall what dropout does, basically on issue, intuition basis, it um, doing training eliminates some components of your input and replaces them with zero. And uh, yeah, doing inference or doing testing validation, it just does nothing. So um, all components are there. Um, the weight has no effect there because we don't want to lose important information um, doing inference. Uh, we can only afford losing it during training. Okay, again, the super class call. And we save the weight in a class variable. And this time we don't have any trainable weights. So we just skip this build part. And we add another argument here, which is the training argument. This denotes whether we are in training mode or not. So this should be overridden by recalling. Um, we have to have, okay, now, now, to be honest, it gets a little complicated what we're doing now, because we have to define a kind of random component that decides which parts of the inputs are eliminated during dropout. So I do it in multiple steps here. We will take um, a uniform distribution in the shape of the inputs from zero to one. And as a D type, we take floor 32. So this is not really what we would expect when we want um, booleans with a certain probability, this weight over here, but we can quickly design our own Boolean tensor that does this by just comparing this to weight. But Booleans are not that easy to compute with, especially uh, in TensorFlow. So we transform this into um, a float tensor. And we don't do it using casting this time, but rather you using tf.where. Let me quickly insert a line break here. tf.where with um, yeah, zero in case we are smaller than the weight and one in case we are bigger than the weight. Okay, this is our random component and we have zeros and ones. And for our dropout, we just multiply it with the input. And because we took the shape here, this is all compatible and we can do it. 
Now we have a little problem in dropout actually, because we are modifying unfairly the sum or the distribution of our input um, when we transform it to output. So we, we remove some components there, set them to zero, and this might actually change the distribution as a whole. Um, but one rule of thumb would be that at least the sum should stay the same um, of, our, of our inputs when they get transformed to the output. So what we do here, as a general standard, we scale our dropout using um, the values that are left. This is how we do it. Sum over all inputs should be or should stay the same. Okay, and now we return again, but this time we decide whether we actually want to do it using TF where. So this is kind of an if, oh, sorry, this, this is kind of an if statement here where we decide, yes, in case we are in the training and not in the testing, for example, uh, we apply the dropped out um, tensor and in case we are not training at the moment, we just return the inputs. It's also possible, maybe you've seen this in the solution document already, to somehow inherit from um, yeah, inherit this training mode from TF Keras back and learning phase, but let's not do that here. There are some weird side effects there. Um, that I don't want to fully dive in, but I think this is this is nice to understand the concept of both dropout and also building custom layers. Let's see whether it works. Yes, works. Okay, and if you want to have a deeper dive, please check out this guide that I linked here. Um, they also start with this custom dense layer. I mean, what else? But um, they get pretty much more into detail there. Okay, let this sink in for a minute and we'll come to the next topic, which is custom loss. Um, so if we, yeah, if we design our model and our, our learning pipeline, then the loss takes a very important role because the loss actually decides for us what's good as a model output and what's not good. Um, this, is, this is really important for training because it's also the end point of our gradient descent. So everything that we want to apply on gradient descent um, first yeah, gets in touch with the loss. The loss is one dimensional, um, which means that yeah, you can optimize it take the best possible loss, uh, the smallest loss. And um, we'll have to keep that in mind when we define the loss in a minute. Um, please note that the loss that we are defining here simply compares uh, predictions, y prep, oh, sorry, um, with y true, which is the a ground truth or just the labels from our data that we will pass in. So it's just a quick comparison of those, writing it into a loss, and we're done. Um, but that might not be enough, actually. I, I noted this down here when I mentioned the add loss library um, or, or API. Take a look at this as well in the end, because simply compare, comparing y true and y pred might not be enough for the needs that we have in our modern ages of, of uh, deep learning. Think about um, regularization losses, for example. Um, this is where you would check out model weights, weights that are hidden inside some layers and would then um, yeah, rate them how good they are or define, define a loss over them and add this up to your final loss in the end. So 
yeah, there it's not enough to compare y true with y pred. It's a bit more complicated, but check out the docs to see how it works and also read a bit into how regularization losses work and where they are used. Okay, let me define our custom loss here. So it's just a function. So our task is define a custom loss that computes a weighted cross entropy. Um, but I define a normal cross entropy first, I guess, and then we'll together have a look at what this weighted means. So we're comparing y true with y pred. And as I said, um, our loss in the end is always one dimensional. So we use a sum over the batch. And um, yeah, here we simple, uh, simply define our um, cross entropy. Um, So if you have a look at the formal definition of the cross entropy here, you will notice that I'll do it a bit differently because it will help us to um, figure out the weights in a minute, but um, it might also help to get the intuition a bit better of how cross entropy is defined or what it really does. And my recommendation for you would be to simply write down a table um, where you um, have y true and y pred on both axes, and for each label zero and one, and then just calculate the loss um, for for one sample and just check whether you understand how this works. So um, we'll use again this weird. TensorFlow representation of an if statement here. And we want to check whether y true is one. But again, um, yeah, this is a bit weird when we compare it with um, normal float values because we also have um, a special data type here because this y true is a label that might be defined as an integer. So we do it the lazy way here which is just using one's like. So this creates a tensor that is of the, sh the, same, the same shape as y true and of the same data type. So in every case, you will be able to define this equals um, operation here. And yeah, this gives us our TF where clause and yeah, in case y true is one, we just take the definition of our cross entropy, which is the negative logarithm of the prediction. And in case it's um, not one, so it's zero, we take the negative logarithm of one minus y pred. So notice that y pred is actually not an integer type, but rather a float type. You can also cast everything um, to make it more robust, but um, yeah, it's a float type. So we're also comparing it to float. Um, there might be, if you tried it on your own, there might be some problems with weird float 64 data types popping up later. Um, this might be because this actually defines the float 32 and all our other operations that we did here are float 32. But if you mix up integer values with float 32 values, they automatically get casted into float 64, which is then in the end again incompatible on some operations with float 32. So let's not mix that up here. Let's simply um, have a float 32 um, and a float 32 be subtracted from each other. And this is the normal cross entropy. But I mean, for this, you could just use the built-in um, loss right. You wouldn't have to um, define a custom loss there. Yes, I agree. 
But now we'll add this weighted components that you see up here. Um, so our task is to rebalance the classes. This is also used as yeah, mean per class or as uh, macro accuracy, if you, if you apply it on accuracy, not on losses. Um, and the idea of the intuition behind that is the following. Imagine you have, um, yeah, you have a very unbalanced data set with, for example, lots of label zero data and very few data with or, or samples with label one. Then the network would be quite well off with always suggesting zero as a prediction. Um, and maybe it will yeah, do that, but on the validation data set, you don't have this um, yeah, biased uh, distribution, which means that you actually get a very good prediction. Uh, um, no, sorry, you, you get a well-performing prediction um, on the training data, but a not so good uh, prediction on the test data or the validation data. And I mean, this is not good. This is not what we want. We don't care in the end about our performance on the training data set. We just care about the validation or the test data. So we want to tell the network that it should, yeah, a bit under um, weight those, yeah, overly often occurring zero labels and add a bit more weight on these one labels. There's another approach to this, which is um, 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 yeah, subsampling or um, super sampling, which would be um, just erase many samples from the training data um, until you get equally many zero and one labels, or just repeat the few one label samples um, very often until they have the same number as the, the zero label samples. So this is also possible, but we'll do it a bit more clever here. But keep in mind that you will still have to have um, multiple or at least one of each kind in each batch or else this weighted cross entropy will not work because then it's just training on one um, kind of label for one whole batch. And you'll also see um, in the math that the, we will there actually divide by zero. So you want, don't want to have this and you want a reasonably balanced um, zero and one ratio at least um, to make it work or at least a very <laughs> large batch size. But yeah, it's okay, it's okay. You will see the point where we will divide by zero here. Okay, so we want to multiply this by a factor and the factor is determined on one hand by um, the number of possible y trues. So this T of size y true divided by um, the true number of y trues. We use some y true. And in the other case, when y true is zero, um, we can just sum those up, but rather we will have to, uh, wait a second, here it is, but rather we will have to sum up the negated version. So notice that here actually we use an integer to um, yeah, calculate this difference. So yeah, or not negated, but rather inverted right true. So the number of those that are zero. But in this form that we have it here, we get an issue with typecasting because this is some kind of integer. And here we have integers, but uh, we want to multiply it with a float value. So what we do here is we add a casting, quickly simply copy it from here. So TF cast, add another bracket at the end. And uh, here again, TF cast. 
So this casts it into a data type that I will still have to specify. I'll do that in a second. TF float 32. So this is how we, uh, we defined our class balanced or weighted cross entropy here. Um, maybe this also was not only useful for you to understand how to define custom losses, but also to understand um, how this cross entropy worked again and why um, a balanced ratio of labels is important. Um, yeah, again, take away please that um, this custom loss here is always one dimensional or, or the result of the loss and that it should be um, yeah, differentiable, for example, um, to make it easy for the gradient descent that you put it in in the end. Um, so it would be no help here to, um, for example, define it as zero in case everything or something goes uh, is wrongly labeled and one in case everything is correct. This wouldn't work. You want to have some kind of differentiable um, version of that intuition. Okay. I talked about this at loss AP, uh, API. Um, yeah, check it out. It might get a little bit more complicated than just using y true and y pred. Okay, custom training loops. Um, this will also be an example that's from the official Keras documentations. So it might seem a bit familiar to you and there's not much going on there, not much special, but um, let's go through this again, step by step. Uh, so you will see on one hand, what's happening actually doing the training when you use Keras.fit and also to see what you can um, adjust during the training. So again, we use class inheritance and we inherit from this model base class. And um, we will overwrite the train step function. So this is not something I made up, this is, um, yeah, if you check the documentation, this is the one function that we have to overwrite. And yeah, it gets past the data. And if you remember the data representation that we chose above or in, in the last lab, then we did it as a tuple of X and Y values. And this is also what we will unpack here. So data is a tuple, unpack it into X and Y. And um, yeah, this always, of course, depends on what kind of data you will put in there. So um, you, you can modify it if you, are, for example, have multiple Y labels um, or, or multiple kinds of labels for each data sample, then you can also adjust it here, but you will also have to adjust it in the workflow for your TF data data set that you defined. Um, yeah, in a training step, what we do is we calculate or compute our Ypred, our prediction from our model. And we can call the model simply by passing X to the self call as a forward pass. And we say, yes, we are training, which means um, it's allowed to adjust the gradients or, or through the gradient descent is allowed to adjust the model weights here. This is called the forward pass. And now we have to compute the loss value. And the loss can be accessed by using this self compiled loss function that's defined through the model API. Um, yeah, we just pass in again the prediction, the true ground truth labels that we have from the data set. And um, we could also provide regularization losses. 
that's a built-in Keras feature, but we'll handle this here also in case you ever want to use something like that. But if you already had a look at the solution, then that's not enough. Uh, you, you'll notice this. Uh, we have to add something else. And I also, uh, also already briefly mentioned it in the last lab. And this is that we have to define a gradient tape context here. And this actually um, instructs TensorFlow to remember to watch the gradients throughout this computation to be able to do gradient descent later. Um, because when you just define a forward pass, then it was would just yeah adjust the or, or not adjust just compute the outputs based on the inputs and the model weights, but it would forget about the whole uh, gradient thing and about differentiation, auto differentiation. Um, yeah, we have to instruct it to do so, and this is why we use this gradient tape. Um, okay, now we need to update our variables. We didn't do that yet. First, let's check which variables are actually defined as trainable. This is also handled by Keras internally. We can just access this from here and have the gradients computed. And this is where this gradient tape again comes in handy because now we recorded the gradients that we wanted to observe and now we can access them on the loss, but only uh, based on the trainable variables. So this actually has the effect that you can disable um, training for some variables and they won't come up here and they will not be changed, even if they would have an influence on the loss. And now let's update the weights. We again just call the optimizer that the TF Keras model has gotten previously doing compilation. We'll come to that later how it looks. Just apply the gradients. And um, yeah, we have in, in this gradients um, list, we have for each of the trainable variable one gradient. And um, yeah, we will have to zip them together to pass them to apply gradients, but this is just something one has to get used to. And this is how we apply the gradients uh, using our optimizer. So in case our model is actually defined or compiled with a metric, like accuracy, for example, which you could plot, we'll come to that in a second, um, we also have to update it because we didn't do that previously. We just computed the loss, but we didn't compute um, the updated metrics and we'll do that here. And this is also kind of built in, just type update state. And um, yeah, this metric is again also computed based on Y, the ground truth database labels and Ypred, the network based prediction. Okay, and as a result, we have to define this is, uh, or, or return, this is defined in the function definition here for this train step, we have to return a dictionary, which returns for each metric, the name and the result. So this is, yeah, this is given, um, but you could also use this to modify which metrics you would like to have at your own custom metrics tier um, or also at them outside of the model that would also be possible. So if you want to get in detail how this fit works, you can check out the guide I linked here. Let's see what that compiles or, or gets accepted by the syntax checker. Yes, it did. So um, 
Yeah, this is how to override the train step. We didn't do anything fancy here. If you have a look, for example, at um, GANs that are quite popular from computer vision, then they have um, yeah, a bit complicated but also interesting um, behavior inside this train step because there are actually two competing models um, trying to beat each other. And this is only achieved by um, yeah, having multiple losses and having them updated one after another, um, alternate, alternating uh, in an alternating way. And uh, yeah, this is also done typically by overriding this train step and in here computing the two losses and updating both one after another. Okay, let's get to how to visualize what's going on um, and how to yeah, see the metrics and see the losses. So last time uh, when Lucas ran his first model really quickly for you, we used a Keras model fit and it has a nice text-based console output where you can already see some loss values and some accuracy metrics. But that's not nice. Um, we would like to have a visual representation of that, a plot uh, with the um, axis, uh, x axis that shows us the time or the steps that our network takes. And on the y axis, we would like to have um, yeah, the, the metrics or the losses. And this is handled by TensorBot. TensorBot is provided with TensorFlow and we can use it as a web application or browser application that gives us um, a nice view of our logs. So um, if you run these commands here, this should be um, yeah, supported inside your Jupyter notebook as um, so-called notebook magic or Jupyter magic um, yeah, commands. So first you load this TensorBot plugin and then you run the TensorBot with a local log directory. But in case this doesn't work, um, yeah, just run this command or this part in your command line and it will start the um, TensorBot directly. Let me check whether that works here. Take a second, find a port to block and to surf this on and then have it run in a browser window. Seems to have worked actually, yes. But the problem is we didn't um, provide a lock yet. So this lock directory is entry, empty. So um, yeah, here we are now um, seeing our dashboards that we can load by providing locks and we'll do that in a minute and then we'll get back at it again to, to see how it behaves with our locks. So how can we integrate this TensorBot uh, with our Keras model? How can we generate those logs that are visualized there? Well, we just um, used a callback function again. And uh, this has a special predefined callback class, the TensorBot callback. And we just provide it with the log directory and the update frequency. You probably want to have a lower frequency here than I do, but um, yeah, I think this is this is fine for for um, just having it visualized. But if you train uh, models excessively, then it probably is too much file writing there. Let me quickly run it. We find it, and then when we assemble everything now, uh, we will provide it with the callback, and then we can see what's going on in, it, in our network. So. Um, I think in the beginning, in the questionnaire, we already asked you whether you have some knowledge about overfitting and the classic way of detecting overfitting, for example, would be to compare the training set performance with or loss, for example, with the validation set performance. And you can also very easily do this in TensorBot just to motivate for you why you should use TensorBot. 
Later in the semester, we also have a look at weights and biases, which is some kind of a, yeah, advanced um, tensor board online that um, also supports hyperparameter sweeping, so choosing the best hyperparameters for your models, um, also on a very visual basis. Okay, let's assemble everything. Um, I also have to motivate a bit there because we are doing things a bit differently than Lucas did last week. Um, so if you recall what, what we did then, um, Lucas used the TensorFlow sequential model, which is a, yeah, a model class that you can define and then simply add your layers into it and it will automatically handle the transfer of your input data to the first layer, then the output of the first layer to the input of the second layer and so on until you have outputs and um, those will be then used in your loss computations. Um, we'll not do that here. We'll do it a bit more manual or a bit more flex flexible, you could also say. And we'll do this by um, explicitly defining each layer and then explicitly passing each input into the layer. Let me do that here. So our first layer will be again an embedding layer. And to get the starting dimension here, we simply take the index length because this gives us the number of tokens that we want to be able to process. And we just have a 16 long vector as an output. So this is the layer definition. And now if we call this layer, I already mentioned that there's a difference. And this is also the reason why we have this weird construction with two brackets, uh, bracket sets one after another. We now call this with the inputs. I'll define those inputs later here. But uh, first, let's take it as given that we have the inputs for the first layer here and pass it in there. And the reason, or, or this, let me clarify what this X is. This X has nothing to do with data in any kind of ways. You, you remember, remember that we use X train, X test and so on, but this is what, something different. This is um, yeah, some kind of intermediate representation inside the network. This is what is passed between the layers. This is what we call X because yeah, I mean, it's some argument of the layers, right? So we can pass it. Uh, this is why we have X and we also override it all the time. You will see that in a minute when I define the next X based on the previous X. So we have the layer definition here and then we type again X in the end to pass it to the next layer. So it's a bit different than this sequential model definition that we had last time, but it's also more, more flexible in case you want to reuse an input somewhere or have uh, branches inside your uh, network that's split up. So this is really useful for those cases. Okay, here we have um, a pooling layer again, just like last time. And the first bracket again is the model definition and the second bracket is the input providing uh, um, call. So something you also have to keep in mind is that if we define the layer, we do it with the first uh, brackets here, then we already set the weights. So you could also type, um, or let, let me quickly type it as you would now expect from what I'm doing. Here use our custom dense layer with 16 output units and just provide the X again as the input. You could also simply write this as, um, yeah, my layer equals custom dense layer 16 and then call x equals my layer x. This has a great advantage over the sequential model definition because then you can also reuse this layer, this very same layer with the very same weights, actually the, the very same weights representation in a later step. 
uh, inside your network. This is useful if you um, want to do inference at the same time or um, yeah, have multiple sets of inputs that you want to pass through the same network, but they are not allowed to mix with each other. Um, so keep that in mind that um, yeah, if you reuse this previously instantiated uh, layer, then the weights are the same. Okay, yeah, but we only have one layer here. Now, as I already mentioned, what we didn't have yet is activation. Activation is really important with dense layers because it's the only thing that provides us with non-linearity. If you would just chain dense layers, then you would, without activation, then you would just have one large linear function. And this is not what we really need um, advanced machine learning with, with gradient descent or deep learning for. So remember to always use activations and we didn't uh, include this into our own custom dense layers yet. So we just have to call this externally and we use the ReLU activation again. Now our custom dropout layer, but you can also, if you didn't define it on your own because it was a bonus, you can also just use the one provided by TensorFlow or Canvas. And in the end, we define our outputs with another dense layer here. And this dense layer has the output dimension or the unit size of one, which means that this is our actual product, uh, pro sorry, our actual prediction that we want to get in the end. And very important here is this sigmoid activation. Uh, we already had this also last time um, to just get it into this zero or one format. Okay, we have our inputs. We'll come to that in a minute, our outputs. And now we have to define the model on, on some, some way. And we use this with our custom model. And now the nice thing about Keras is that we can define a model by simply providing the inputs and the outputs. And well, it's a bit misleading here because you're not actually providing any input data. You're rather providing an entry point to get to where to put the data. So the model gets told here, where should I put the data? We have an object here. And then it will supervise the whole way until we get to the output. So remember what we did over here with a gradient tape. This is exactly what we are calling there. And then this, uh, yeah, this this uh, whole model can be used afterwards. We can already, I think, use model summary here. But we forgot one important thing, as I already told you, and this is defining the input um, layer. So in Keras, this is handled as a layer, just like this, and you simply provide it with a shape. So keep in mind that every layer you define here actually accepted a batch um, yeah, as an input. So the input was oftentimes at least two dimensional where one dimension, the first dimension was the batch, batch size. And the second dimension was, for example, the text length or uh, the vector representation. So we also kind of reflect this here in the input layer, but uh, we don't um, write it down as a shape like batch size um, and then the text length like this. No, we don't do that. We note down the batch size externally as an additional argument. This is a bit cleaner. Okay, so here we can now get the model summary. Let me quickly try whether that works already. Looks good. And here you can observe the output shapes of each leather layer and um, yeah, this none is still a bit unknown size, but um, nevertheless, through the pooling, 
we get known shapes and here we get for each of the 64 batch samples we get one prediction as an output okay now let's compile the actual model we have to do this to specify the optimizer and um, specify the loss definition i think we already did this also last time Again, using Adam here, this time calling it explicitly, which also gives us the opportunity to define a learning rate here, uh, which is something I think we didn't do last time. But you can also then try to, to take this learning rate as a hyperparameter and um, optimize a bit on it. That's possible. OK, loss definition, we just plug in our custom loss function here. And yeah, fitting the model is then done using model.fit on our training data. And again, observe that this is just our TF data data set. So we did a very nice job there, um, batching everything, for example, preparing everything to pass it through the network later. And we can also the same way provide um, a validation data, but keep in mind, so we have this as a test data set, we didn't batch this yet. This is not batched, which kind of makes sense because you want to don't want to repeat it or anything and you don't want to lose anything in the end. Um, if, if you would discard um, the remainder of the batching, but ah, without batching, it's not compatible with our network definition here. So what we do here is we batch this with, with um, the batch size one. Okay, and the callbacks, we still have to provide them. There we only had the TensorBot, sorry, TensorBot callback defined this time. Last time, remember, we also had early stopping, I guess, and... Um, there was something else also, but um, ah, the checkpointing, yeah, right. But um, yeah, keep in mind, you can also define your custom callbacks. I didn't include this into this tutorial because um, yeah, the functionality is quite limited what you can do with the callbacks um, using such a train step definition is in most cases, um, more flexible because or more what you want um, but yeah for everything that just at the end of a batch at the end of an epoch for example um, there you can use callbacks that would be working let's define for how long to train this 10 epochs should be quite decent and um, the, the problem is that we didn't really specify or we, we lost the definition of what an epoch is. So last time we passed um, an ND array to model.fit, which was working fine. And we also had inside the size of the ND array um, encoded um, the definition of how long an epoch would be. So how long it would take to see all the data. Here we used TF data data sets, pre-batched them and even repeated them, which means that um, this model.fit has no chance of figuring out how long an epoch should be. So yeah, we just define it ourselves. Um, simply this value. This, this is typical for um, data set that are really large, so large that they wouldn't even fit in memory at once. So um, keep that in mind that epochs here is some kind of made up construct. I think the shape was 25,000. So you could also uh, write it this way. Um, yeah, let's, let's try that. But um, in the end, it doesn't really matter. Um, oh wait, divided by the step size, yeah, uh, with the batch size, yeah, right. Because we already pre-batched the data. Yeah, probably fine, just taking 1,000 there, but um, just to clarify this. Okay, and then we're done. Let's train the model. 
And you can see here it's running, it's passing our data through the model. There's some pro problem here, some warning with serialization as, as JSON because we used a custom layer and didn't provide a proper config that could be used to reload this uh, when we save the model. So saving the model and reloading it up again would only be possible if you if you would rely on the code that I wrote here, but this is not the fashion that you would want a model to be reloadable. So the suggestion here is to provide a get config function that, that overrides um, the Keras layers layer, get config function, and is able to yeah, output a configuration that could be loaded up here later. So yeah, maybe as a homework, try to do this. Um, probably a nice idea. Okay, let's have a look at what the TensorBot actually does, whether it already works. Yes, we already have our first learning curve here, even with validation data, I guess, but I don't see it here. Uh, probably not defined yet. That's also quite difficult in this small window, but um, can I do here? No. Um, yeah, just maybe as a homework also, as a homework um, experiment a bit with the Tensor, tensor board and try to figure out um, whether you're encountering overfitting here on our data set or whether the module is just decently small and you don't encounter overfitting at all. That would be interesting. Let's have a look at the model again. Yeah, it's running in the second epoch. Looks good. Yeah, what we didn't do here is we didn't provide an accuracy metric that would help us in the end to um, yeah, really observe how well it's performing uh, in a human readable fashion. I think Luca, Lucas did it last time. So have a look at, back at his tutorial again, but um, yeah, we just use the loss here and you just see, okay, the loss is decreasing. Good enough. Yeah, but, but for the real application, you also want some kind of performance metrics that's beyond taking the loss. Okay, that concludes this session. Thank you for tuning in. If you have any questions, uh, just write on Discord or um, ask us in the next lab slot. And I wish you very nice and happy holidays and see you then.